Welcome to Comic Talkers, where comics is always the top of our discussion. I'm Mary. And I'm Brandon. And we are back with almost the end of our 52 book club. We are on week 49. As always, we have a playlist. But don't start here. <laughs> don't. Um, this is one of actually, uh, aside from I think week 52, this is maybe the worst place you could start. Um, please go back. If you haven't caught up with us, please go back. Um, otherwise, I'm going to keep pushing on um, because we have some very exciting things to look at this week. Absolutely. Um, so we we kind of really open with Shang Tzu facing off against Alan Scott, the first Green Lantern of Earth, mm -hmm. um, who is also now head of Checkmate and is still functioning with the Justice Society of America. Alan's got a lot going on and none of it is particularly good. Um, I don't often feel very bad for Alan Scott, but this is definitely one of those times. It's like a dad always getting involved with his kids and then yet then feel tired after a while. Listen, usually the things, the bad things that happen to Alan, a lot of the times they're his fault. In this case, it's not. And I actually do feel for him here. <laughs> And Shang Tzu is asking Alan, how much will you give me for Black Adam? And Alan says he's not merchandise. Um, and Jake Garrick even says, we're just here to get him out of your torture chambers. When we last cut off, uh, Dr. Savannah was torturing Black Adam after the mad scientists of Oolong Island had um, somehow very miraculously managed to capture Black Adam. It was the pep talk. Come on now. You know that just as much as everybody else. Come on now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The pep talk about um, nerd stereotypes from the yeah. 1980s. Yes. <laughs> um, so inspiring. Um, definitely what they needed to hear. Hurrah. Uh. Um, we, of course, cannot have a comic from what is the early 2000s without some very typical sexism with someone, I don't even know which scientist this is, wanting to test out hypno goggles on Power Girl. Doing great, folks. We're doing great. At least Dr. Savannah doesn't want to hang around for that. Yeah. Um, he's looking for teleport control. Um. Alan Scott says we can and will take him by force if we have to, but then um, the Great Ten of the Chinese People's Republic shows up. We've seen them earlier in the series. They haven't played a super big role until very recently. Um, and socialist, the socialist Red Guardsman, because, oh man, we love the Sinophobia, <laughs> says this island and everything on it belongs to China. Uh, if you set foot on this island or elsewhere on Chinese soil, it will be considered an act of war. That any attempt to retrieve Black Adam will be met with ultimate force. Um, we then see Cheng Zhu talking with some of these scientists. He says, finally, the fate of the world is in my hands the way it was meant to be. We've achieved great things. Today, we work for Intergang. Who knows what tomorrow might bring? Now prepare your weapons. Our shields will need to hold. Uh, our shields will hold until we need them to. And then he sort of goes after Will Magnus, who is continuing to have a no good, very bad, horrible time on <laughs> He says, my plutonium man, is he complete at last? Um, he says, we may, Shang says, we may wish to activate him as an opponent for the American superhuman Adam Smasher. I wondered, how is it that you endow the metals with life? Um, and so the will sort of starts trying to talk. He says, oh, this, this is what makes it all possible. Responsometer technology. Do you know much about my work? And Chung says, enlighten me. And Will starts start talking in this sort of abstract alchemical way about how I thought that they were all looking in the wrong direction for artificial intelligence. He says, I figured things were already smart. I had the idea that we call that what we call personality traits might actually indicate the presence of certain metals in our bodies. We experience harmonious atomic grid of gold as feelings of selflessness, nobility, and heroism. Lead is our stubborn refusal to quit. Iron, our inflexible, indomitable self-determination. He says, I was regarded no better than a medieval alchemist. So he was like, uh, yeah, doesn't sound like science. <laughs> and Will says, well, Professor Mara was the only one who didn't laugh at me. And Chuck Zhu sort of comments on how there have been 
certain materials that have come into the laboratory and yet have not left the laboratory? Well, it says you have me under surveillance. You should have been looking elsewhere. See, I'm not a cybernetics genius like Professor Morrow. I tinker, but it's really the responsometer that does all the work. Once a metal is animated, it takes a form that perfectly expresses its own nature. So you wouldn't have seen me doing anything. Metal men pretty much build themselves. And they can be any size. Um, and this is where Chung Tzu sort of has this dawning realization of what's about to happen to him. And then Will releases his little tiny metal men. <laughs> Um, they're so small. They're adorable. I love them so much. <laughs> um, he kind of releases them from just like a little pill bottle, which I think is the best part of this is how small they are and how much damage they end up doing. <laughs> um, because they they sort of immediately go into being a team uh -huh. and sort of going up against Chung Su. And we even see, um, I'm pretty sure it's aluminum, who says, I may not be as t -t -t tough as you guys, but I know how to blind an egg, which I, that line cracks me up. I don't know why, <laughs> but it's so funny to me. <laughs> um, they send Mercury with Will Magnus, um, who of course has his, 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 his this is, I think Mercury says this about as often as Sam Guthrie of the X-Men says, I'm nigh invulnerable when I'm blasting. Say, Doc, did I ever tell you I'm the only metal that's liquid at room temperature? <laughs> um, and he even keeps it up as Will's getting shot at. Um, yeah. I love when he's sitting there on his shoulder like, hey, you know, let's talk. <laughs> and Will is having continuously bad days. Uh, Will's having a terrible time here on Oolong Island, and you know, I'd like to say this is different from the rest of his life, but I would be lying. Dr. Morrow sort of has a giant gun on him. At this point, then, Alan Scott um, is still trying to talk. He's like, well, we're not representatives of a country. We're free agents, and the ten are like, they're the Justice Society of America. <laughs> Fair enough, yeah. you know. Um, it's pretty. It's pretty solid logic on their part. I can't deny that. Um, and they're they're having a not great time. And they sort of remind them, like, okay, our orders are, are given. Move any closer, and there will be war. Mm -hmm. and Alan says are you really willing to start World War III over one man and he says why he just sort of gets stared at and he says because you're covering something up aren't you Cheng Zhu is a member of the Great Ten we then um, see Mercury get shot um, by Dr. Morrow who has a particle wave pistol he says hey Hate to think of the damage it could do to the old varsity tie. He starts trying to talk Will out of lowering the shields. He says, this place is crawling with angry superheroes. He says, it's too late. I'm disabling the island defenses. This has to stop. The Justice Society will be here soon, and all of this will be over. But this control here operates Savannah's teleport link to his Omnibot, currently in geosynchronous orbit above our heads. No one would know. I mean, in all the confusion and chaos, you could have gone anywhere. Mario says, why are you helping me, Will? I've been absolutely rotten to you, my boy. I don't deserve your loyalty. Will says, maybe not, but like I said, you were the best teacher I ever knew. I try to overlook the whole psychopathic supervillain thing. Mario stands within the teleporter and says, well, we all have our flaws. <laughs> I love it. I love Their I... relationship is like the best part of this comic for me. I'm not gonna lie. Okay, so you would actually put them over Renee in question? Oh, okay, I have listen, Renee, Renee and Charlie get taken down a pig because they operate out of Gotham. Which means I have to deal with characters I hate. Well, technically they're out of co or they deal with Condoc more than they deal with Gotham. Yeah, but like in general. Uh, yeah, yeah. If I want to access them, I have to deal with bats. 
<laughs> fans, tell us if you like T.O. Morals and Will Magnus's relationship, or do you like Charlie's or Renee's relationship? I'm not, I don't dislike Charlie and Renee. It's just the people around them. But but I will admit, I do love that line. And then him standing in the teleporter, like, okay, I'm not going to fight you here. Just beam me up, Scotty, pretty much. Which is a line that's actually never spoken in Star Trek. Did you know that? Yeah. <laughs> um, Sorry, Star Trek. And we then see Dr. Savannah um, sort of looking for his remote, and he goes, that Boy Scout, Will Magnus, stole it, didn't he? Or was it Mara? <laughs> um, and Mike Adam is trying to talk to him, and he's like, oh, hush, I'm through playing with you. He says, but I thank you with proving which torture toys of mine will work on the Marvel family. It's like, I was especially happy with the Thunder Pliers. I'm wearing that toenail around my neck for luck. Um, Black Adam says, I will pull you apart and feed you to Billy's Talking Tiger. We love Talkie Tawny in this house. Um, Dr. Stefana goes to leave. And then we're back with um, the Great Ten and the JSA. They're like, oh, Cheng Zhu, a member of the Great Ten? That's ridiculous. But Alan sort of pieced everything together and says, Oolong Island was a red Chinese stronghold from way back. Under orders from Beijing, Cheng Zhu and his crew used intergang money to build doomsday weapons with only one purpose, the assassination of the Black Marvel family. But no one expected Black Adam to survive the attack. And now you're here to finish the job. Because if any of this gets out, if he gets out, your bosses are first on the firing line, and Cheng Su knows that too. He wants to play us all. And you can see the Great Ten who are back at headquarters who are like, how does he know all this? Uh, Power Girl brings it to Alan's attention that the shields are down. And Alan says, tell your superiors this, Black Adam is one of ours. We're taking him into custody, we'll leave Cheng Su to you, and there won't be a war. Um, then we sort of see everyone pointing at Will Magnus going, he's here, he disabled the shields, and now he's trying to escape in the Omnibot. And Will's like, oh, just step aside. Cheng Su says, you only have the one weapon, and you are no match for the great Cheng Su. And Will says, I have a bullet. Go get him, lead, and just shoots um, his little tiny lead metal men through Cheng Su's head and cracks the egg. Um, and he says, and then he looks at everyone else and he says, drop it. I have a particle wave ray gun and bipolar disorder. I have no idea what it might do to you if I pull the trigger. Now, I hate that they're using Will's bipolar disorder like this, because that's not how it works. No. No. It doesn't. Um, and this falls into a lot of the older tropes around Will Magnus, where they are very much trying to use him being mentally ill as a scapegoat for him being not a great person, which is not at all how that disorder works um but he very much does fully crack the egg in the most violent rendition of Humpty Dumpty I have ever seen in my life <laughs> this would be the story you tell kids that they want to miss oh hey Humpty Dumpty and something falling off that brick. got shot in the head by a lead bullet uh, yeah I got shot in the head by Will Magnus um it's the best version yeah, absolutely obviously um and then the jsa shows up and i'm gonna let brandon take it from yeah so of course um the professor that um tried to like we said in the beginning we can of course leave it to these some dc writers to be sexist right away um of course is the first doctor to kind of like oh hey Do green lantern dr madness will magnus is that you and he goes i think so i surrender and of course, it's the doctor that um, has the hypno glasses. And he's looking at Super or um, Power Girl and just like, work, you stupid things, work. And he's just sitting there trying to have the hypno glasses work on Power Girl and it ain't working. Um, and of course, we see Dr. Savannah start leaving the lab. And Adam Smasher is the one to notice it. So he starts to follow. And as he tries to stay, or when Savannah starts running and goes, where did Moro go? Alan's master grows to, you know, grows or, or increases his size 
and picks up Savannah. He goes, where's Black Adam? And, of course, Savannah's refusing. He goes, tell me or I'll grind your little bones to dust. And he goes, I believe you. And he pretty much tells him where he is, and he finds him. Now, Adam Smasher does go in there to help Black Adam escape his restraints. And, you know, Adam Smasher also lets him know that he's there with the Justice Society, and we're going to get you out of here. And, of course, Black Adam goes, you're here with the Justice Society? And he goes, they'll take you into custody. They'll keep you safe. He says, I won't stay in your custody, Albert. The ones who orchestrated the murder of my family still breathe. Justice must be had. And Adam Smasher goes, and what about the justice about the justice for all those innocent men, women, and children? They said you killed in Byla. And Black Adam just stares at him. And Albert And this is um those of you who have seen um our Adam Smasher versus Ant Man, you'll know that. Black Adam's kind of looking at Al specifically to be like, um, didn't you do a lot of things to avenge your mother? Why are you trying to stop me from avenging my family? Right. And something else we want to bring up too is that Albert actually has been one that has does not want to believe that this has happened because Black Adam has turned a new leaf. He had he pretty much was given everything he's ever wanted. And now he's going back to his old ways. And Albert even states, it wasn't you, was it? It was one of the horsemen they built here. If you murdered that country, you know you could never go back. You could never watch over Kondok again. You could never protect your people. Tell me it wasn't you. And Black Adam states, they wanted a war, Albert. I'm going to give it to them. It's not over. Now, we go to Infinity, Inc. and Metropolis. Now, we do see a few of the surviving members um, from the Everyman incident back in week 35, um, Nuclon, and a couple others. Um, and, of course, Jade, which we find out has survived as well. Um, she states, the whole world's turned against Luther and all of his Everyman experiments. And Nuclon goes, we're more than experiments, Jade. And Jade goes, there they, there are only a handful of us left. But we can still be the future. We can still, Nuglon goes, we can still run in and save the day when it counts as Affinity Inc. We can still prove to the world that we can do it better than those stupid old men in the JSA. We only need a chance. Well, their chance is about to start coming. Because here comes Black Adam racing against the world. And so that ends our main issue for this week, but we are going to go into the Origins of Justice Society, um, which I'll be going over. Um, it's And of course, it's written by the great Mark Wade. We love him. We support him, other than if it's world's finest. Then that's where we kind of start questioning. Um, anyway, say it's the following. They were the first super team, icons of the golden age of heroes brought together to protect America during a time of global war. As the Justice Society, they served mankind for more than a generation before disbanding under pressure from a misguided government. Gone but not forgotten, the JSA was eventually summoned out of, the, out of retirement by their successors to Justice League. The Society soon found that, when it came to their motives and their methods, the new, this new era was more forgiving and more accepting. But time itself was not. Even superheroes age, and as younger heroes joined the JSA, the might of its elder statesmen gradually flickered and faded. Some returned to civilian life, others fell in battle, and those who remained prepared to march gracefully into twilight. But the fires of another world, another world war, reignited the JSA's fighting spirit. The impact their heroism provided their knowledge and exp experience, which or rallied Earth's soldiers at a critical moment, gave the society a renewed sense of purpose. Despite their weariness, Flash, Green Lantern, and Wildcat realized they had no right to abandon younger, her younger heroes to careers of great power but little guidance. Together, operating from their new headquarters in New York's Battery Park, they have just dedicated 
themselves to recruiting and training the new generation of crime fighters. And of course, we get kind of the lineup now, which involves Damage, Cyclone, Star Spangled Kid, Obsidian, Alan Scott, Power Girl, Jakeem Thunder, and Thunderbolt, Starman, Sandman, Liberty Bell, and Our Man, Jay Garrick, Citizen Steel, Dr. Midnight, Mr. Terrific, and Wildcat. And of course, their essential storylines is Justice Society Volume 1, All-Star Comics Archives, and JSA Justice Be Done. Uh, this will end this week's issue. Um, we are going into World War III next week. Um, so we hope you join us for week 50 as we do that, along with discuss World War III a little bit. Um, so check us out. If you like this video and you want more, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit the bell notification so you never miss an episode. And if you like this video, hit that like button. Um, check us out on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at Comet Talkers to get all the latest updates. Also, for other great anime and comic book content, check us out on Spotify for Podcasters, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. And without further ado, my name is Brandon. And I'm Mary. And may comics always be the top of your discussion.